And now it's really an honor to be able to go from your remarks to my dear colleague, Monica McMahon, who many of you know, she's associate professor uh, in the family health care and nursing department at the University of California, San Francisco. She's also affiliated as an affiliated scientist with advancing new standards in reproductive health. And I could go on more, but Monica, please uh, share your wisdom. Thank you so much, Claire. I am just grateful for you and grateful for the organizers of today's meeting. Um, and it is just, uh, wow, I get to follow Julia, <laughs> who is a colleague, collaborator, and friend. Um, I'm going to do something I historically don't do, which is I did not prepare any slides. I'm going to read some remarks because I wanted to be very thoughtful in terms of how to get people to understand the root causes of poor maternal health outcomes. And so I want to thank all the organizers, especially Rose. I want to let everyone know that I use she and her pronouns. You have my consent to uh, tweet my words or use them on social media, I will be posting these comments to my Medium page after I provide them. We know that racism has been declared a public health crisis from the increased rates of COVID-19 infections and the deaths among Black and Latino populations to the perpetually higher rates of violence and police brutality that Black, Indigenous, and other people of color communities face. There are prevalent and persistent flaws in our nation's structures that negatively impact determinants of health and outcomes as Joya so clearly outlined. I wanna take us to a different place though, because COVID-19 has bared for all of us to see the so many flaws that need a do-over, a reimagining, and a reconceptualization. And I don't know about you, but if the last year and a half has taught me nothing, it is this, that this was all built and it doesn't have to be this way. And I'm convinced that our panel today, Dr. Kriya Perry, Marina Farrell, and everyone that you will hear from has many of the answers and that this could all be different if we would choose to listen and act. That said, I've organized my comments today around three important aspects of the root causes of poor maternal health outcomes for Black and Indigenous people. I've also included some suggestions and strategies to reimagine and disrupt these root causes because critique without action in my view is not going to move us forward towards the solutions necessary to mitigate harm. And as Joya has mentioned already, Dr. Kamara Jones, for far too long, she aptly has described us and settling for the inaction in the face of need. <clears throat> With that, let me bring forward these three aspects for the root cause of poor health outcomes. Mistreatment and disrespectful care, reproductive injustice, and the lack and our lack of political will to diversify the healthcare workforce. In 2019, I wrote a piece for Scientific American called to prevent women from dying in childbirth, first uh, stop blaming them. I stand by every word I wrote then and now. And as a matter of fact, they will be re-releasing an updated version of that data visualization project in July in a special edition that is themed around racism. In that piece, I summarized existing knowledge about the root causes for maternal morbidity and mortality in the United States. And I carefully explained that many of these deaths were preventable and that symptom surveillance, early symptom recognition and reporting are critical components to prevention. Unfortunately, disrespectful care and mistreatment during pregnancy and childbirth have been shown to be widespread in the United States our work found that one in six birthing people report experiencing one or more types of mistreatment, including being shouted at, scolded or threatened, being ignored, refused, or receiving no responses to requests for help. Now, I'm not gonna go into extreme detail here because my colleague and co-conspirator, Dr. Saraswati Vidam, is participating in this workshop. And I will, and, but I do wanna ground us in the notion that mistreatment, particularly being ignored, refused, or receiving no response to requests for help contributes to significant delays in the provision of care to pregnant capable people. I will also make the point that patient mistreatment and clinician burnout are two sides of the same coin. 
because I believe our workplaces are inhumane. And until we address that structural issue, we will continue to see the provision and receipt of disrespectful care. Now, one mechanistic, mechanistic consideration is that work specific to birth settings and auxiliary and alternative maternity units should be centered because for far too long, birthing people have had limited options in how, where, and with whom they shepherd new humans to this plane. And I believe they deserve better. Let's talk about reproductive injustice. The purpose of today's meeting is to attempt to achieve health equity. And I view that as the scientific equivalent of evidence-based truth and reconciliation. To be even blunter, as I wrote in Scientific American, maternal morbidity and mortality are significant public health issues that highlight shameful health disparities that burden Black and Indigenous communities. However, disparities in maternal morbidity and mortality, in my view, are only a symptom of the underlying problem, which is reproductive injustice in the United States. Because disparities in the reproductive health outcomes are not exclusive to the perinatal and postpartum periods. When you look across the reproductive spectrum, adoption, abortion, contraception, family planning, maternal fetal medicine, reproductive endocrinology and infertility, gynecologic oncology, Black and indigenous individuals have poorer outcomes when compared to white pregnant capable people. And these observations of poor reproductive outcomes for black and indigenous individuals are important because it's already known that the experiences that people have of care during their reproductive years has lifelong implications for if and when and how and where they access healthcare in the future. I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time on this point because I know my colleague, collaborator, co-conspirator and friend, Dr. Karen Scott will highlight her important work with Dr. Donna Ayeen Davis specific to obstetric racism. However, a second point about reproductive injustice is this notion that disparities in the distribution of disease, illness and wellness are not exclusively determined by the behavior of individuals. Julia clearly outlined this on her slide, walking us through how we develop social determinants of health and where they come from. They don't come out of thin air. And so highlighting the potential mechanisms of how reproductive injustice is fueled by institutional racism and class oppression and gender discrimination and exploitation, that clarifies why addressing the social determinants of health requires structural appro approaches. I've said this on social media a million times. In other words, interventions that target individuals are insufficient to address structural problems. For example, we already know that routine prenatal care, socioeconomic ed status, education, insurance types, and rates of pre-existing clinical conditions among Black women, the burden of maternal morbidity and mortality is equally shared. I want to add that data from a recent study that examined the dual burden of severe maternal morbidity or the, the near misses and preterm birth have shown that these combined clinical experiences have the potential to disrupt maternal role attainment, lactation and breastfeeding, the transition of families and postpartum mental health. And these have important life course implications for individuals. It's one of the reasons why I always say highlighting these data show the limitations of exclusively relying on hospital-based birth data because they are nothing more than a representation of a single episode, birth. Pregnancy occurs over time and it occurs everywhere. It happens everywhere. And so we are never going to resolve the social determinants of health that impact poor outcomes without community-based analyses that have to be prioritized, as Joy has said, with outcomes other than I survived birth. Given that disrespectful care, mistreatment, and poor reproductive health outcomes are all equally shared, I believe that community-centered intervention should be developed, deployed, and evaluated. My research and the research of many others have described the healthcare seeking behaviors and experiences of Black women, Indigenous people across the reproductive spectrum, including investigations of structural racism and strategies to improve maternal health services provision. 
patient satisfaction, and information and power exchange during healthcare encounters. We need to focus more perhaps on community sensitive outcomes like maternal role attainment, like lactation and breastfeeding, like family transitions, and like postpartum mental health, and moving away from an outcome exclusively surviving birth. One hypothesis my data and other data have generated from our previously uh, conducted community engaged research is that access to racially concordant and culturally relevant teams, and I'm talking case managers, doulas, midwives, nurses, nutritionists, physicians, social work, all of us, are essential components that work synergistically to improve experiences of care and trust in health systems. Which brings me to my last point. Racial discordance between clinical providers, clinicians, scholars, and communities have profound implications. Interpersonal processes of care, including social concordance and communication, have been shown to be significant aspects of quality care. There is a substantial body of evidence that exists that describes health disparities among and between populations. Yet in my view, this work has not spawned effective, novel, or sustainable interventions that are designed to mitigate disparities and achieve health equity. I will also point out that recent research has evaluated different models of care to the inclusion of racial equity lenses when you add on to curricular development and clinical care provision. It shows that cultural and racial concordance are essential components to improving experiences of care across the reproductive spectrum but specifically for pregnancy-related care. I wanna to point to the qualitative research and uh, other studies conducted by Dr. Rachel Hardiman and others who show four distinct themes that are essential elements of racially concordant care that is specific to Black and Indigenous birth workers. First, clinicians need to acknowledge how the cultural identity of patients determines different aspects of the clinical encounter. Next, uh, we need to think about the stated commitment to and both interpersonal and institutional commitment to racial justice, the institutional and personal commitment to agency, and the cultural humility that is grounded in the reciprocal nature of the relationship between clinicians and people seeking care. So one additional structural exemplar of reproductive justice or injustice, excuse me, is the segregation rampant in health services provision. My co-author and pediatrician, Dr. Rhea Boyd, outlines this beautifully in work specific to the segregation of hospitals and healthcare services, and particularly those institutions that have been land grant and legacy organizations. I wanna remind all of us that according to data from 2015, only 65.6% .6 of the US population is white. And however, 83.2% of licensed nurses and 90% of certified nurse midwives are white. The physician community is a little bit more diverse where 49% are white, but only 4% are black or African-American and 4.4% are Hispanic and 0.4% are native indigenous or Alaska native. While we understand these differences, in the concordance and discordance of the workforce, also realize there have been attempts to diversify the healthcare workforce using incentive and pipeline programs. And these programs have been funded by the federal government, the private sector, and interestingly enough, they've had some mixed results. But I wanna point us to the, the positive portions of the mixed results, because we already know from these studies, the Sullivan Report and others, People of color in the health professions are more likely to serve minority populations. People of color and healthcare providers are more likely to work with publicly insured and minority populations. And programs that provide financial incentives to any healthcare provider who serves minority populations and historically, ex historically excluded communities have, been, have not been more successful in programs that just hire, train, Black Indigenous healthcare providers to ensure adequate workforce in under-resourced settings. So in closing, 
we have a unique opportunity today to curate a conversation, a different conversation about the data that are necessary to improve health outcomes and to achieve health equity. Doing so will require disrupting stigma, shame, judgment, and blame narratives that are grounded in gender oppression and patriarchy, misogynoir, and white supremacy. And doing so will require the need for partnership across disciplines and spectra who serve pregnant capable people. And finally, without a robust social safety net that includes things like paid family leave and expansion of insurance coverage and access to services, we will continue to pontificate about poor outcomes without constructing the care and including the policies that are required to achieve superior outcomes. So with that, I thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts and my insights and I look forward to the continued discussion today.